All right, now it's time to talk about European arrival in the New World. And probably would have worked out a whole lot better for everyone concerned if they had worn masks and been socially distant. However, we're still not ready for Columbus. We're going to start with some earlier Europeans, actually almost five centuries earlier. And we're talking about, of course, the Norse, or Vikings, as they were sometimes called. The, uh, the Norse were Germanic peoples, Germanic tribes. Uh, Norse meaning, you know, from the northern area of Europe. And more specifically, uh, when we're talking about uh, the Vikings, we're talking about Scandinavia. So that's the present-day countries of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. The dark red shows where those, uh, those Scandinavians lived in the 8th century, that is the 700s. As you can see, by the 9th century, they had uh, pushed forward uh, northward and filled in that area of, of Sweden, chasing the Finns and Laplanders out, essentially. And um, <clears throat> after that, as, as you can see, they, they traveled pretty extensively. Now, they have a reputation as fierce warriors. There's always, uh, seems like there are always new fictional representations of them. But in addition to, to being warriors, they were explorers, they were merchants, they were traders, and they were farmers. Uh, and they got around. Uh, they got... Uh, as far as as Russia, there were Viking settlements, Norse settlements, essentially in in Russia, that shaped what would later become that country. And as you can see, all the way down into North Africa, eventually by the 11th century. Well, um, by the uh, the the ninth century. The Norse had made a foothold on the island of Iceland. And then over the ensuing decades, they settled pretty much the whole island. Then about a century after that, a uh, Norseman living on Iceland, Eric Thorvaldsen, known as Eric the Red, was, was banished for killing somebody. Uh, and he headed, uh, headed west and found Greenland. Well, pretty soon there were, uh, this was in 985, he came back and he uh, returned to Greenland with several settlers to establish settlements there along the, uh, along the western coast of Greenland. Well, that's where this guy enters the story. Bjarni Herjolfsson. Bjarni Herjolfsson was, uh, was a Viking ship captain who was on his way to Iceland for his annual visit with mom and dad. And when he got to Iceland, he discovered that uh, they had just left. They had gone off with Eric the Red to establish a colony in Greenland. So he decided to follow them there to visit mom and dad in the new settlement in Greenland. However, uh, because he had never been to Greenland, nor had really much of anybody except Eric the Red and his crew, and these people he just took there, they didn't have maps, and uh, there were some stormy seas, there was also quite a bit of fog, and uh, essentially, they missed Greenland, and uh, didn't realize they had missed Greenland, and just kept going, and they uh, eventually sighted land, uh, actually three different land masses that were covered with trees. So that couldn't be Greenland. Uh, Greenland is a fairly barren place, which is kind of, kind of interesting, you know, because Iceland is greener than Greenland, and Greenland is icier than Iceland. When they're trying to, when Eric the Red was trying to get people to come with him to this settlement, he didn't want to say, "And hey, guess what? It's even worse than here." Uh, instead, they called it Greenland, but it wasn't so green. 
anyway, uh, Herr Jolson and his crew spotted this distant shore that was covered with trees. So that couldn't be Greenland. Then they realized, oops, we missed Greenland. We need to turn around and go back if we want to get to it. Herr Jolson's men said, hey, as long as we're here, why don't we just keep going and see what's over there? See, uh, uh, see what land mass this is. But Bjarne had already missed Dad once. Uh, so I guess maybe he was a little worried about that. So he's like, no, nah, i got to go see Dad. Uh, so they turned around and found Greenland, finally. And when they got to Greenland, they told everybody about this mysterious place they had seen even farther to the west. And there were a lot of people that were heaping congratulations on Bjarni Herjolfsson for having potentially discovered a new place. But then again, even more people were like, you didn't actually discover it because you didn't bother to go there. Well, uh, Bjarni hung out there in Greenland, but then his dad passed away. So Bjarni went back to uh, Norway without ever checking out that mysterious, foggy, distant shore. By the way, most likely what Bjarni Herjolfsson and his men had seen was Baffin Island, marked there with a B. There's G for Greenland, I for Iceland, and perhaps Labrador. Um, but he, uh, like I said, didn't check them out. Now here is another view looking down on the globe from top, from the top, so that you can see starting in, the, in Iceland there, the voyage of Herjolfsson. And how, you know, when you miss Greenland, you are, go you are going to run into North America. Anyway, this now is where this individual comes in. The son of Eric the Red, Leif Erikson, who about uh, 15, 16 years after Bjarni's voyage, and after everybody had been talking about how they had seen something out there, Erikson, or actually Leif uh bought the ship off of Bjarni that he had sailed on, and he hired 35 men to crew it, many of them sailors who had been on the original voyage with Bjarni Herjolfsson, and this time he set out intentionally to see what was out there. And they did, in fact, sight Baffin Island, and then they landed on a Labrador, marked with an L, and then finally in Newfoundland, marked with an N, where they established a colony, which they called Vinland, because uh, there were a lot of grapes. Vin is in the, the vine. Uh, so they established a colony there, which um, never exactly flourished, but kind of hung in there for a while. Now, there were some issues that they had to deal with. For example, the native people. Turns out, Vikings aren't such great neighbors, uh, and there was some conflict with them. The Vikings called them scraylings, which uh, uh, is a term that uh, they would later apply to other Inuit or proto-Inuit peoples, which is what these were. So there were, there were fights, there were conflicts. Uh, eventually, the, the colony just sort of uh, dried up, but for a long time, the colony was uh, cutting down trees to take back to Greenland. That was the biggest attraction for even finding this place to start with because there's very little wood in Greenland. Uh, even after the initial colony failed, there's evidence of uh, repeated excursions by the Norse over the next couple of centuries. Uh, and there has been archaeological evidence found in Newfoundland of uh, this, their settlement and some of their camps. Uh, there has been some evidence, uh, perhaps uh, it's not 100% uh, verified, of Norse camps farther inland and farther south. But eventually, they just stopped coming. Now, why was that? Odds are, uh, it's because they eventually abandoned the colony in Greenland by... Uh, about the 14th century because uh, it was just really difficult to kind of uh, scratch out a living in Greenland and then the little ice age started. The temperatures got a lot colder which made it even harder 
And then those Skraelings, those Proto-Inuits, the Thule people, uh, migrated eastward, and they wound up on Greenland, uh, competing with the Norse there for the meager resources that were available. So eventually the, the Norse abandoned Greenland. So when they did, well, if there's no one in Greenland, then there's no reason to keep going to Vinland to get wood for the people in Greenland. So they just eventually kind of stopped going. And after a while, after a few generations, it was really only, uh, only through the epic poems about Eric the Red and Leif Erikson that uh, people even knew about that distant land. And by people, I mean other Norse people, not so much people in other parts of Europe. And so it was a few centuries before Europeans again made it into the Western Hemisphere and what they would eventually call the New World. Now you might wonder, if the Vikings could do it, why couldn't anybody else? Well, for one thing, uh, and we'll discuss this more in a little bit, the types of ships that Europeans had at that time, which were single-masted square-rigged ships, couldn't make it across the Atlantic Ocean. So, if you were from one of these other European countries and you headed due west into the Atlantic, um, for one thing, you don't know how big it is. No one has any idea how big it is. And uh, you're, you're not going to make it too very far before you'll lose wind in your sails and before eventually you'll either get stuck and starve to death or sink. So you couldn't go that way, uh, why not go to the north and take the same route the Vikings took? Well, that's because there were Vikings there, uh, and they were controlling the shipping. Now, the, uh, the Norse were able to make it to North America because they went in kind of small legs of the journey. Because first they went from uh, Norway to Iceland. Then from Iceland to Greenland. And then from Greenland to Vinland. And uh, that, was kind of, that, that was kind of a unique situation. They felt they had no further reason to, to go to, to North America. And uh, everyone else just kind of uh, went along their own way and were concerned about basically other things. All right, so... That's it for our discussion of the Vikings. So, now, now, still not ready for Columbus. What we're going to do instead is we're going to go back to about the time that the Vikings were losing interest in Vinland, and we're going to look at what was going on in those other European countries that is gradually going to set the stage for what is known as the Age of Exploration which will lay the foundation for Columbus and a whole lot of other things as well. The Age of Discovery started in the 15th century, but it had its roots three centuries before that, maybe even four centuries before that, with the Crusades, that uh, um, series of adventures embarked upon by Europeans, European Christians from various different, uh, different countries, different kingdoms, into uh, the Middle East, into Palestine, the uh, quote-unquote the Holy Land, to reclaim it and take it away from the infidel, from the Muslim people, uh, peoples who were living in that area. So lots of, uh, lots of intense fighting over a long period of time. However, it was also an expansion of the European worldview, of the average European's um, um, kind of, uh, um, well, perception and understanding and experience of the wider world. So lots of nobles went on these, sometimes kings went on them, and they took armies with them. So if the king's taking his army, that means he's taking his nobles who are taking their knights. And a lot of times the knights also took um, their 
uh, their army, some of their just uh, regular peasants along to do the, you know, the fighting. So when they got to the Middle East, in addition to, uh, in addition to fighting against, uh, against Muslims, uh, taking cities, losing cities, and so on and so forth, they also encountered a lot of new things. Uh, things that were wonderful luxuries, things which the uh, peoples of the uh, the Muslim world and the Arabic uh, world had access to, like coffee and sugar and cinnamon and various other things. Which, um, well, I shouldn't be I shouldn't be mean about English food, but traditionally. Uh, prepared, it can be kind of bland, as well as, you know, uh, a lot of these things were good for being preservatives as well. So uh, a lot of this stuff, people, uh, European people, uh, experienced for the first time, developed a liking for, and wanted to be able to get more of in the uh, years that followed. Now, this stuff was mostly coming from other parts of the world, and it was uh, winding up in, in the Middle East. So what the uh, Europeans wound up wanting were various spices that uh, were coming from India, and other spices as well as things like silks and porcelain that were coming from China. Um, now, the, uh, the Chinese had uh, uh, been sending materials toward Europe for centuries, since about 200 B.C. on the Silk Road. So this map here shows a lot of different things. The, uh, uh, this is a map, actually, of the Silk Routes. So there are several different, uh, different routes through which Chinese goods made it to the Middle East and from the Middle East to Europe. The Silk Road is the red line right across the top that goes from uh, left to right, or actually from right to left, from east to west. Uh, that was a connection that they had actually with the, the, the Roman Republic once upon a time. Uh, things had kind of gone up and down depending on the, uh, the politics in, in Europe and in the uh, uh, areas of Central Asia through which this road passed. But... Uh, stuff was coming from China and winding up in Europe, but it wasn't going directly to Europe. Let's take another look at this map, these things that they wanted. In order to get to Europe, had to pass, in, any, in, in order to start in the east and end up in the west, they had to go through the middle. They had to go through the Middle East. Uh, so the trade was actually between Asians and Arabs for the most part um, and then from there the trade went from the Muslim world to the European world with a significant markup both because the middle literally the middlemen uh, wanted to make a profit and you know there's also that crusading business that's ultimately it turns out not good for business so the, uh, the Europeans, in order to get access at more affordable prices to these things from the East, wanted to bypass the Middle East and deal directly with the people in uh, India and China, which, uh, which the English called Cathay back then, and various other places. Now, this is the world as it existed, uh, the Eastern Hemisphere, in circa 1200 A.D., which was around the time some of these Crusades were going on. Uh, later on in the 13th century, by 1279, the Mongol Empire, which had been pretty small at the beginning of that century, had expanded quite a bit, as you can see, and it covered most of, uh, most of Asia all the way into Eastern Europe. Well, uh, that's, that's not good if you're in Europe and you don't want to be invaded by Mongols. Also, it's not good if you were in 
South Asia or Southeastern Asia and you don't want to be invaded by Mongols because they um, have access to the resources of all these places they conquered, right? Which makes them increasingly more powerful. So that's not a good thing. On the other hand, if you're a European, on the other hand, if you're a European and you want direct access to China, that Mongol Empire actually is a good thing, especially after 1279 when they conquered the Song Dynasty and took over China as well. What that means is that to pass from, from Europe all the way to China, you don't have to negotiate your way through a bunch of different little countries, each one of which might deny you entry. It's only one country. It's one empire. So if you get permission from the emperor of that empire, you could walk to China, basically. And for a brief time, when the Mongol Empire was at its height and controlled all that much territory, there were a handful of Italian merchants who did make that trip. Maybe you've heard of this guy, Marco Polo. That's the circumstances in which he was able to go and meet Kublai Khan, the uh, emperor of the Mongol emperor of, of China at that time. However, that didn't last very long. The Mongol empire broke up into a bunch of little pieces and uh, those little pieces were taken over by different groups, different people, um, so that eventually the whole area was, was in control, once again, of various Muslim powers, so that, you know, they don't want you to break their monopoly, so you're not going to be able to walk there anymore. So you'll have to find, if you want direct access to China and India, you have to find another route. Now, here's, here's the big problem for Europeans by the late 1300s, and that is, this was their known world. This was the, the area about which they had maps and knew what was there. Essentially, Europe, and uh, areas, that, the northern coast of Africa, uh, along the Mediterranean, and a little bit into Central Asia and down into Saudi Arabia a little bit, and Palestine, those places where they had gone a crusading before that. Uh, India, they knew vaguely, is, is out there somewhere around uh, the region where I have the name. And, and China, they know, is much farther to the east than that. No idea how to actually get there. However, pretty clear, they can't get there by land. So there was some hope that they might be able to get there by sea. Now, by this time period into the 14th century, Italy had made some significant nautical uh, advances, kind of by necessity. Now let's take a look at some basic ships. Uh, in the European tradition. There on the upper left, we have a, a, an ancient Greek ship. In the upper right, we have a Roman ship. And you can see the, uh, uh, the, the, the design hasn't changed that much. And Egyptian ships looked about the same. A big square sail. Sometimes a smaller square sail in the front. Uh, lower left, that is a Viking ship from around the 10th century. Also, a square sail. Well, in the Mediterranean for centuries, almost a thousand years by this point, um, not just in the Mediterranean, but also in, in, in China, um, the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean, the, uh, uh, the, the various Muslim powers and their navies had been using these triangular sails for some time. Pretty good for zipping around the Mediterranean. Uh, the advantage of these is that the back end of this triangular sail, you can move it side to side so you can catch the wind. That's the disadvantage of the big square sail. If there's a strong wind, poof, along you go. Uh, as long as the wind's blowing, if the wind dies down, you're stuck. Or if the wind changes direction, 
If it starts blowing the opposite direction, you're really stuck. Uh, with this triangular sail, you can make little adjustments to it and catch the wind. Uh, that will allow you to tack, T-A-C-K, into the wind. So you can actually travel straight, well not straight, but you can travel into the wind by kind of adjusting your sail and catching it on the side and going over to the left and then going over to the right and then to the left, kind of zigzagging. That's called tacking. Um, in, in Italy, the city-states along the coast of Italy had for centuries been having to defend themselves against the navies of the various Muslim powers. Uh, and so they picked up the use of these sails, which had actually been, uh, to some degree, used by the Romans, uh, but had never really been used that much in Western Europe. So... Uh, people started calling, the other Europeans started calling this sail design Latin for Latin because the Italians were doing it, which is kind of unfair because the Italians were just the first Europeans to borrow it from the people who had been doing it for many years. Anyway, um, Italian navies got really, really good because they had to be because they were constantly fighting against the Muslim uh, navies. So there, there became a tradition of Italian navigators. And all this is leading us up to the early 15th century and some very significant technological advances that are going to change everything. By the way, I thought I should probably show you an image to demonstrate what tacking means rather than just explaining it. So you can see here the wind is blowing downward, blowing from the top. And the tack is when you change the sail around so that you're going, you're zigzagging. And if you're not aware of these nautical terms, starboard means right and port means left. So you may find yourself asking, the starboard tack, if starboard means right, why are they going left? Well, the starboard tack, that means that the sail is adjusted so it's catching the wind from the right side and that blows it to the left. Okay, So that's, that's tacking. That's a way you can go against the wind without going directly into the wind. That's also where we get the expression, taking a different tack. All the time, I see people, um, uh, not so much in papers, because I think a lot of students uh, in the 21st century have never heard this expression, but you see it a lot in media. And I, I frequently see people misspell that uh, as T-A-C-T, -T, or pronounce it that way. It's not taking a different tact. It's taking a different tack. So what that means is, what it means to take a different tack, this isn't working the way we're doing it. We need to take a different tack. That means going straight ahead isn't working. We need to hit it from a different angle. All right, well, back to those inventions. Those inventions were these three things. The compass, so that you could tell where you were. The quadrant, so that you could figure out where you were going. And the caravel, so you could get there. The caravel was a, a new type of sea vessel. It was very light and kind of small, therefore very maneuverable and fast. And it had uh, not one Latin sail, but several Latin sails, so that wherever you were, whichever way the wind was blowing, you would be able to catch it in some way. And that would enable you to, to keep going and enable you to do that tacking. Um, and because it was, it was so light, you were able to not only go against the wind, you were able to travel further. And this was, this was huge. Now, after the caravel, pretty soon after the caravel, there were other ships, uh, new types of ships like the Carrick, C-A-R-A-C-K, that had both square and Latin sails, many of them. But it was the caravel that first enabled Europeans to venture farther out into the ocean. Now, not sure how nerdy all of you are, 
but if you're as nerdy as I am, you're familiar with Sid Meier's Civilization, which is still still around. It's I forget what what version is out now. Seven, maybe. Anyway, um, it's a, a it was initially a computer game, and in it, uh, basically the way it worked was you have this whole new planet uh, with different continents and, and and so forth, and you start off with with like one guy and you start exploring right and then you as you get more advanced you start inventing new things and what you would do is that the parts of the uh the map that you had not explored yet were black well before you get to the point of inventing the caravel if you tried uh, uh traveling too far out and into the sea with one of those square rigged single uh, single mast ships you would go out into the black area and then your ship would disappear because it has sunk and it would turn black again but once you get the caravel why you can go right up into that uh, black area easily and light it all up and discover new continents and that's uh you know that well that's a really good way to uh to illustrate how important the caravel was and the first people to make really good use of it were the Portuguese. Now, I talked about how Italian navigation had become very prominent, and there's going to be a lot of explorers who were Italian. But so far as a government getting behind exploration, why in Italy there was no single government. There were each city was its own government. There were city states, but over in Portugal, the uh, uh, well, he wasn't the king of Portugal. He was uh, a prince, Prince Henry. Maybe you've heard of him from school before, Henry the Navigator. He was one of the people in line to be the king, but he wasn't even first or second, I don't even think, in line. He never became king, but he was very influential, very prominent as a member of the royal family, and was able to convince the king, his relative, to invest money in navigation schools in Portugal and to invest money in lots of, lots of ships, including caravels, so that, uh, so that the Portuguese could start trying to find a sea route to those, uh, those areas that they wanted to trade with. And in addition... In addition to India and China, another valuable commodity that could only reach Europeans through uh, the, uh, the, the Muslim population of North Africa was gold, gold from South Africa. So the, uh, the Portuguese started uh, making these voyages. Now, Henry himself didn't get on a ship and sail across the ocean and discover things, but he was very... Very influential in getting this ball rolling around 1400. Well, the first thing that the Portuguese did was start sailing down the west coast of Africa, past their traditional enemies in North Africa, to see what lay beyond that. And they encountered the Canary Islands. That's them that are circled right there. Uh, on the Canary Islands, there were native people living there who had been there for, well, a really long time, obviously, um, who had not been in contact with Europeans. So, of course, they took over the Canary Islands. As they started to go a little bit further out, they discovered these other islands, the island of Madeira, for example, uh, which, um, if you're a wine drinker, um, Madeira is a type of port wine, uh, port originally is from Portuguese. Also, the Azores or the Azores, uh, which is a, a chain of, of islands. So the Portuguese discovered these, and there were some of the islands had people on them, most of them did not. But uh, they discovered that the climate on these islands made it possible to grow things there that you couldn't grow on the mainland and that you could previously only get 
through those brokers in the Middle East. You could grow coffee and sugar on these islands. Well, uh, they started uh, planting people, having settlers go onto these islands, and therefore they were called plantations. And they started growing this stuff, eliminating the middleman. However, they needed labor. And uh, they tried to get hired labor from Portugal, but not too many people were willing to go live on a distant island and just work like dogs for, uh, for very little pay. So what they did was they started taking the local indigenous people of these islands and the people from the Canary Islands and enslaving them and forcing them to do the labor on these plantations. However, there weren't a whole lot of those people. Those people had, uh, well, they had uh, issues with, I think, resistance to, uh, to diseases. And they mostly died out pretty quickly. Uh, it didn't, didn't help that they were being virtually worked to death. Well, as it turns out, as the Portuguese had been going down the coast of Africa, just below the Canary Islands, uh, they discovered, um, came into contact with various peoples of West Africa below the Sahara that were a part of a long-established slave trade that had initially been used by the uh, Arabs to take African slaves uh, into the, uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Well, the Portuguese started buying those African slaves and having them work on these islands. Now, they didn't have to buy a, a huge number because these islands were pretty small. But guess what's going to happen when the Portuguese and their Spanish frenemies um, get across the ocean and discover a whole new world full of places where they can grow stuff? They are going to need more and more labor. And so the slave trade that the Portuguese were the first Europeans to tap into is going uh, to just exponentially explode and turn into something that was not even recognizable compared to what it had been before. It becomes so huge and such an important part of the global economy by that point. So if you... Uh, Think about it uh, just a little bit. You don't have to think too much. You can realize that um, the environment, the environment of those islands that the Portuguese discovered once they had the means to get there, the environment of those islands is going to really alter and affect the whole world uh, after that. It's... Uh, kind of a linchpin on which this whole new system of doing things develops. By the way, once Portugal and Spain, again, they're frenemies, once uh, they sort of got involved with that slave trade on what was known as the slave coast of Africa, that uh, area there on the west that kind of sticks out just below the Sahara. Uh, and by the way, it was the Portuguese initially who were doing the trading in slaves, and they would then slave those or trade those African slaves then to the Spanish. Once they started doing that, between 1450 and 1500, there were about 100,000 African slaves transported to Spain and Portugal. And for the most part, they were being sent to the Canary Islands, which Spain controlled some of those as well, as well as the, uh, the other islands that we talked about. Okay, this is, even, this is before things really kick into high gear with the slave trade once the Western Hemisphere is discovered, which is going to be in 1492. There's a hint about that Columbus guy. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the other Portuguese voyages, though. Um, in 1445, Portuguese sailor named Denis Dias and his crew got all the way down the western coast of Africa, all the way to Cape Verde, which is the, uh, the southern tip of Africa. 
uh, and and they they got past that. That was called rounding the horn, so that subsequent Portuguese voyagers, like Vasco da Gama, who was uh, in 1498, so that's six years after Columbus's voyage, he is able. You can see there in orange to go all the way down here. Uh, in west uh, western uh, coast of Africa, around the uh, Horn, and then start heading up the east coast of Africa. And when you do that, it's just a matter of time before you, as uh, Da Gama did, actually reach the Indian Ocean and India itself. So, we, we've talked about Da Gama now, 1498, finding India, which... I'm assuming you know Columbus was looking for it in 1492. So that means now it's time to talk about Columbus, right? Well, almost.